Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about the writing competition. I'm going to talk about how to get good at blue booking and make law review if that's something you want to do for some strange reason. If you're new here, I'm Zoe. I've made law review not once but twice. So I'm just going to share what works for me, hopefully quickly. The first thing you need to know before you even begin this video is that every school's writing competition is created differently. I took it at Penn and it was, the blue booking part was three two-hour sessions for a total of six hours and when I took it at Stanford it was one long six-day stint. That's just an example of how different competitions can be and those differences can affect what you prioritize in your time when you're doing a writing competition. So at Penn for example, in our two-hour stint we were not expected to finish correcting the entire document. It's made sense not to try to make everything perfect but to do everything you know and then go back and spend time looking for the things that you might need longer to figure out. Whereas at Stanford, because it was six whole days, there was, I think, a greater expectation that your whole product would be more perfect. So I would take time looking for the things that I didn't know. All that to say, know your rules, play to your game. Now, the thing that I think is still in every writing competition is blue booking, which is just correcting citations which is so very fun i'm gonna spend the majority of this video i think talking about how to get good at blue booking because i think that is very intimidating for a lot of people rightfully so the blue book is the legal field citation form you spend a little time blue booking in your first year writing and research course but a lot of people kind of brush it off because it's I mean, it really does not feel like the most important thing compared to your doctrinals, which is totally fair. But this is where it all comes back in the writing competition. Some people get very intimidated. They think that they need to read the whole blue book, memorize the blue book before the writing competition. You don't need to do that. In my opinion, getting good at blue booking is knowing where to look in the blue book for any given source. I have broken down seven steps how I tackle a citation, either in a writing competition or now that I'm on law review, actually when I'm editing articles, how I do it the most efficiently, quickly, and accurately. So blue booking for the most part, it's all about footnotes. Footnote, of course, directly relates to something that was stated in the text, a claim that the author made, and the footnote is used to support that author's claim. Usually in a footnote, the author will give several sources. Could be one, could be ten, you never know. It's really up to the author. First thing I do, I just read the footnote, know any glaring errors I see. The more time you spend with this, the easier it'll be for you to pick up. You'll get better over time. But when you're not good, step one is recognize the type of source that you're looking at. So, the first thing I do if, when I read a source in a footnote is I determine what it is. Is this a book? Is this a law review article or another journal article? Is this an internet source? Is this a newspaper? That's the first thing you do. The second thing is know where to find that type of source in the blue book. So at Penn, we were not allowed to use the online blue book, so I tabbed my blue book. Um, some schools, you're allowed to use the online blue book, so you can just search journal. You can search book. Since I tabbed mine, I would say this source is a case. I can turn to this case page and this tells me exactly how I need to cite a case. And so I would compare the blue book to the source that I'm looking at and I would correct everything, the typeface, the page number, the order of everything, the year. I would make sure that is all exactly like it looks on here. I will say, even though I can use the, blue, the online blue book now, I still most of the time just use this because it's faster for me. The one con I think with the online blue book is that when you type something, it's kind of like a Google search. It'll pull up all of the relevant information and a lot of that is not helpful to you. Like you really just need to know what like a journal article article citation looks like and if you just type journal article you might get a lot of random things especially if you forget that a journal article is called a periodical in the blue book in my hard copy blue book i can just flip to this first page and i know that what i need is going to be right here versus on the online blue book personally i get sensory overload if it works for you you can skim quickly like by all means do that but i would spend some time looking up phrases on the online blue book if you're going to use that so you know what you have to type to get just the basic citation form of every type of source so we got step one recognize the type of source that you're looking at i'm going to use a law review article for this example just for the sake of consistency so we have our law review article we found where to look for it under the periodical section in the blue book and we have corrected the citation format itself for that type of source. Then step three, you have to think about abbreviations because nothing is simple. If it's a common word, if it's a long word, or if it's neither of those things, sometimes if it's just a word, it very likely has an abbreviation in the blue book. There are two, type, two main types of abbreviations. One is just like words. And for my words, I have my tabs up here, common words, table six, and I will turn here. 
and I would see all of these lists of words that have abbreviations. I would see that contract is abbreviated by C-O-N-T period. I would see that forum is abbreviated by F period. There's just so many abbreviations. This is one page, but there's, there's three pages of just words. That's a lot. And that is like impossible to memorize. I'm sure someone out there can, but like that's a waste of time. I think like with the abbreviations, you just need to know if you're looking at a word and it looks common, probably has an abbreviation. You know, just read this page before so you can like have an idea of what kinds of words have abbreviations so that you can know to turn to this page when you come across a word that you might think is abbreviated. And since it's alphabetical, like see the word you're looking for. If it's there, great, abbreviate it. If it's not, move on. And the thing with abbreviated words is that they're not optional as they are in most cases. Like if the word has an abbreviation, you have to use it or your citation is wrong. I know, sounds crazy, but sway the world okay so i said there were two types of abbreviations one is just words two is institutions which most of the time especially for articles periodicals is going to be like a school name so for example this is my common words tab this is my institutional names and periodicals tab here we have a list of like a lot of schools basically and so i see that harvard is abbreviated harv period i see that i can't read backwards sorry i see that Boston University is abbreviated B dot U dot. I see that UCLA is abbreviated UCLA no dots. Do you see how there's a lack of consistency? And I don't think there's a reason for that. You will begin to memorize school names. Like now I can tell you, I know that Columbia is always C-O-L-U-M period. I know that University of Pennsylvania is U dot P A dot L dot R U V when it's University of Pennsylvania Law Review. I memorize those things now, but when you're just starting out, you like these things, you, you're not gonna memorize them. So the key is to know, to look for the institutional names and periodicals tab. I don't need to know the page number because I have my tabs. My tabs save my life. I strongly recommend. If you just look up like how to tab a blue book, something will come up. So once you have your abbreviations, you change any words in your, in your citation so that everything that's abbreviated needs to be abbreviated okay thankfully that's pretty much it for the citation itself so now that we have the formatting of our citation we have to make sure that the proposition actually says what the authors is claiming it says a lot of times honestly like on the writing competition but also in the real world unfortunately authors will cite a source that does not actually support what they're saying or they'll cite a source that is literally contrary to what they're saying it's our job to prevent false citations from entering academia so i don't know if this is on every writing competition but you may have to read the sentence like in the main text what the author is saying and then go to go find the source that's being cited and read it to see if they match up read it to see if they actually say the same thing and this is where you have to be actually very critical it cannot be close enough it cannot be mm, i see how you got that it actually has to you have to be able to logically actually be able to draw the conclusion that the author is making by depending on the source that they're citing unless this is where we get to step five there is a an appropriate signal for the citation so signals basically contextualize the citation a little bit more most citations will be supporting the claim that the author is is stating so the author is saying it is raining today and then cites a weatherman saying that it's raining today and that's just a straight up citation if the author is saying oh it's raining today and then cites a weatherman saying that the chance for precipitation is 100 percent, that might be a c signal because the source that the author is citing clearly supports the author's proposition but it's not saying the exact same thing so that would be a c the author says it's raining today and then cites a weatherman saying it's sunny today that would be a but see, if the author says it's raining today and then cite something saying it's also raining tomorrow, that might be a compare signal. My point is that step five is add a signal if necessary. I suggest reading in your blue book the signals because signals are actually a lot more intuitive than like a lot of the other rules. They actually make sense. Read that because you'll probably just memorize it naturally and that'll just make your life easier. Step six, after you add a signal, if you, whenever there's a signal, you have to add a parenthetical. That's how most journals do it, at least. So if you just straight up cite a source, no signal, no C, no nothing, you don't need a parenthetical. But if you cite a source and you say, see this source, compare this source, then at the end of your citation, no commas, no nothing, you put a parenthetical explaining why you're bringing in that citation. 
so the author says it's raining today cites a weatherman that says it's sunny today and then you know but see then the parenthetical might say showing that sometimes it rains and is sunny on the same day that's that's a, a rough example but my point is if there's a signal there has to be a parenthetical Parentheticals in writing competitions are often looked on very favorably. In my pen competition, our parentheticals were worth like 10 points and just correcting like like a period or a comma was worth like one point. And parentheticals, you know, really aren't that hard to come up with. It's usually just like, it shouldn't be more than one sentence, first of all. And it's just like a, a summary of what the relevant part of this citation is. So not that hard and very useful. After you add your parenthetical, then you have to order the citations within the footnote. So there's rules for what order citations can come in and it basically goes from like most supported to least supportive but the, it's based on signals so again i would go to my signals page in my blue book i would see rule 1.3 which has the order of signals and it would tell me what to do that exhausted me just talking about it sorry for you guys in advance but yeah after that you're pretty much you're done with the footnote pretty much of course there's like smaller rules that i didn't talk about that you should know about like you should know that the period after id is italicized you should know that the comment after c.e.g is not italicized but i guess i would actually read something that i wouldn't read is the short form section of the blue book which is rule four i would read rule four of the blue book and mine it's page 79 and it talks about short form citations because once you cite something in full once you can usually do a short form of that citation after that there's a lot of rules but truly the key is knowing where to look which is why my tabs save me Oof. Sorry, like I just feel bad for you guys that you have to go through that. Hopefully this helped though. Actually, my last tip, if you have like a writing component, an actual writing component, writing your own thing of the writing competition, my biggest tip is to avoid being too creative. Most of the time, they just want to see that you can write clearly, you can write concisely, and you can write based on the facts that you're given. So if they provide you like a writing example, just follow that as closely as you can. As, as you can. This is really not the place to like try to think outside the box and, you know, show all your creative talents. Just be very boring, honestly, very to the point because they're looking for a reason to take away points and like they're not going to be able to do that if you just are clear, concise, to the point they don't want to see superfluous stuff in that okay well that's all i have to say um good luck and before you do the writing competition think about why you want to do law review okay bye